Welcome to What's the Tea, the TransLink podcast. I'm your host, John Jang, and on this episode, we're going to explore some of the exciting new projects we're planning to build. I will mention, though, some of us are secretly rooting for it to be called the 99 Tree Line. What could that be all about? Let's find out and tap in to What's the Tea. The next station is... Welcome to What's the Tea, the TransLink podcast. The sea bus, SkyTrain, all the buses, West Coast Express, Handy Dart, this is the TransLink fleet. And you already see them all over Metro Vancouver. Hopefully we're part of your daily commute. But this is what we already have. So what do we have planned for the future? To put it simply, a lot. I think what's really going to be key is how is TransLink uh, serving the needs of the region? You know, our measure of success is really how nimble can we be in adjusting service to meet the demand that's out there today. And again, I think it's going to be all around how is TransLink meeting the needs of the region? Uh, We're going to make sure that it is. That is TransLink CEO Kevin Quinn laying out his vision. The public transit equation, if you will, is simple but true. Higher demand requires higher supply. And part of building up that supply is building new projects to improve our service. And as Metro Vancouver continues to grow every year, our system needs to expand so that we can continue to provide reliable transportation. And I'll be honest with you, that is where the fun begins. We know where we want to get to. We have an idea how we want to get there. We then have to figure out how we pay for that. And so that's really what I do in my job. I spend a lot of time working with the mayors, with the governments of British Columbia and the government of Canada in order to help us pay for building and running all of those services. This is Sabrina Lautexier, and at the time during this conversation, Sabrina was the Senior Manager for Investment Plan and Funding Strategy at TransLink. Basically, it was her job to figure out how TransLink makes money and where TransLink spends money. And to that end, let's do a quick overview of Transport 2050, TransLink's 30-year transportation strategy for Metro Vancouver. Imagine a future where everything you need is within a 15-minute walk where the streets are quiet and safe for you to walk, bike, roll, or something else. Where better transit and on-demand choices mean we don't have to rely so heavily on cars. Where the air is clean and transportation doesn't create pollution. A future where we spend less time in traffic and more time doing the things we love. You shared your vision for the future. Now we're sharing ideas that'll get us there. So for me, the most astonishing part of Transport 2050 is its ambition. It dives into some of the most pressing issues of our time, uh, climate change, affordability, rapid technological advances, and reconciliation, social equity, resiliency, important in our region of earthquakes, for example, increase access for everyone through a series of 100 different actions, that is a project or a service or a policy that we need to put into place over the next 30 years to achieve those goals and targets that we set out for ourselves. What are some of the most ambitious plans that you're excited about or, or the ones that people really should get excited about? Okay, that's a great question. Now, 100 actions, 30-year time frame, that's all a little bit overwhelming. So last year, we created this document called the Transport 2050 10-Year Priorities. It's kind of all there in the title. Which projects in Transport 2050 do we need to focus on funding and delivering over the next 10-year period? In that document, uh, it talks really about the fact that it's a bus-based approach, and that's the way that we can get the fastest amount of service out to people in the hopefully shortest amount of time possible so we can meet that urgency. There's a sense of urgency with this plan. Another uh, little known fact about uh, T2050 is we spent a lot of time working with the equity seeking focus groups trying to make sure we were really approaching the development of that plan with an equity lens. And one of my biggest takeaways from that process was um, the need to improve comfort and safety in all of our transit stops and stations. It wasn't necessarily about the shiniest projects. It was about that basic bread and butter. How do I feel as I'm waiting for my bus? And this is a theme which continues to resonate today. When are we getting the SkyTrain extension to UBC? Arbutus is a great start. And for a lot of people, that's a huge victory. But for UBC students, especially those that might be using the SkyTrain anyways, as part of their commute, they'd love to see that extension all the way up to campus. How do we make that possible? And and what's the timeline looking like for something like this? Uh, Well, that's a great question, John. And um, 
it really does take a very long time to get a big project off the ground. I'm going to start to I'm going to back that up a little bit, but the UBC project has been we're, we've been working on it for a very long time. These projects are significant investments and it takes time to get it right. And so uh, all the way back to for example the the, region, the importance of the regional transportation strategy the lines that we're building today all had their original genesis in a regional transportation strategy. So some of these projects that have opened in the, in the recent past, the Canada Line, Millennium Line, the Evergreen Extension, all these rapid buses, and even the Broadway Subway and uh, Surrey Newton, uh, Surrey Langley Skytrain, uh, all of those started off 30 years ago in 1993 when the region adopted Transport 2021. And so some of the reasons why it uh, can take so long the project might need several stages of development. You've, maybe your first stage is to figure out what is the problem that we're trying to solve, what are the ranges of alternatives. Maybe the second stage is figuring out what those promising alternatives look like, doing some early consultation with affected groups. Your third stage could look like um, selecting a preferred alternative to advance for more detailed development in something like a business case. And then your fourth stage would be to make that detailed business case. We want to make sure that the estimate, the the cost that we're allocating to build that is as accurate as possible. So it could have some early engineering works, um, making sure that uh, all of those things are about as, as well known as possible. Then the final, once that business case is approved at the federal and the provincial level, the final piece of the puzzle is the region's share, not only for building it, but also our share of operating that new project for the duration of its life cycle. Once all of that is approved, I describe it as the tap turns on and we can go to procurement, we can find someone to build that. And I was really um, excited to see that happen in the phase two investment plan when we quote unquote turned on the tap for that um, Millennium Line Broadway extension or the UBC project out to Arbutus. The rest of that extension out to UBC, we identified some planning study money for that back in 2018. So maybe steps two or three of what I just described. And I know that uh, there's a very brilliant team currently working hard on step four in order to get that detailed business case that would get us to the stage where the project has been defined enough that we can turn on funding for that project. It really is up to the region's mayors to figure out the timing and the prioritization of projects. And so um, that part of the process is still still happening. One thing that I'm curious about, it's the gondola project at Burnaby Mountain and the role that TransLink will play within that. Maybe just walk us through your sort of excitement for this one, because when I think gondola, I think beautiful scenery and and maybe like, you know, the North Shore Mountains. I would never have imagined a gondola kind of like in our backyard in a way. Can you imagine taking a gondola every day to get to school? That sounds pretty neat, right? <laughs> um, you know, New York City has an urban gondola. It, it goes from Manhattan over to Roosevelt Island, but uh, it still kind of reads as a little bit like a quaint tourist attraction, but you pay for it with your Metro card. Uh, so the gondola is a very new, uh, it'll be a very new technology to this region. It has a very strong... Um, business case in terms of being able to move bus uh, operating dollars away from buses and over towards the gondola. Um, similar to how we described the UBC project, it's going through its own series of business cases. And so um, we're looking forward to when that project is developed enough in order to turn on some funding in order to get that, uh, get that built. But I will mention, though, some of us are secretly rooting for it to be called the 99 Tree Line. And a strategy for the next 30 years. That's right. Uh, Transport 2050 itself hasn't been costed out, but the 10-year priorities, that first 10-year priorities, it has a very preliminary early estimate, uh, back of the envelope as a guess of about $21 billion. I might have mumbled that a bit. <laughs> I think the knee-jerk reaction for most people who uh, might just be the average customer taking the SkyTrain maybe a few times a week, they might go, whoa, that's, that's a big number. Like, I, Am I going to have to pay more because TransLink has all these ambitious projects? Like, how does that all work in, into into the equation? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, it is a very big number. It is something that requires a little bit of a rethink about how we fund our, our services in this region. Um, Transit's being called on to respond to a wider range of national and provincial interests than it ever has before. It's no longer just about mobility, about getting people from home to school, for example. Now they're they need to be they're called being called on to support record setting population growth, whether that's through, uh, normally through immigration, really. Um, it's also being recognized as essential for bold action on climate change. And finally, it's critical to ensuring that there's some affordability in supporting new housing starts so people don't actually have to be in their car to uh, to get everywhere, that they have some options where they live, where the new housing is going to be constructed. Um, and so on one hand, there's this temptation to either 
cut costs in times of fiscal pressure on uncertainty. But as we know, in order to meet these bold challenges, this is something that requires a certain level of service, a certain um, a role for transit to play in supporting that. And so that's one of the things that we're looking at with our uh, provincial and, and to a lesser degree our federal partners is what is that funding uh, mix looking like? How do we make sure that transit is um, fit for purpose and is serving those regions? And in a lot of other cases, those time you, uh, fuel sales tax, which is approximately 20%, and then property tax, which is 23%. All of our other sources are much, much smaller. Our hydro levy is small. Um, people often ask me about advertising. That's about 0.8% of our revenue budget there. And there are limitations to how much we can increase all three of those major sources. You can't really increase fares without disproportionately having um, impacting people that can't necessarily pay more for those fares. And then you're also driving people towards cars. Uh, you can't really increase that fuel sales tax before... The pandemic, one of our biggest issues was fuel sales leakage. Once you leave Metro Vancouver, you pay less tax on fuel. You can also go over the could go over the border. Um, but now the biggest issue really for that source is the rapid adoption of EVs. And Vancouver has a really robust um, uptake on electric vehicles. You can see that in the long wait times in, list, uh, to, in order to get one. Uh, and so it's one of those things where we're kind of a victim of our own success in the sense that we're trying to get people away from uh, using internal combustion engines. And that makes the fuel sales tax a really uh, risky source to depend on. Let's hold there for a moment and just dive a little bit deeper on that. Sabrina laid out the three general sources of income for TransLink. That's fares, the fuel tax, and property taxes. I mean, yes, there are other smaller sources of income, but those are the most prominent. So how does that compare with transit agencies in other parts of the world? Let's find out with another Scoop with Coop. Here's our friend David Cooper from Leading Mobility Consulting. So the TransLink model is actually very envious for other transit agencies. I've done a lot of work on funding tools the last few years. And when you look at the funding model of transit agencies, I'll pick on Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, Ottawa, and the funding tools that they have for the day-to-day -day operations is extremely limited. The funding tools are very much about transit fares and property tax. TransLink has the most diversified set of policy and funding tools in the country. Right now you get 18 and a half cents a liter on a gas tax for day-to-day -day operations for transit. That's unheard of in the rest of the country. You get a parking tax, not just for on city streets, but also on, on private lands. That's unheard of. There's a hydro levy, there's development cost charges. Uh, you have the ability to implement a benefit area tax in your legislation if you choose to do so. Other agencies don't have those tools at their disposal. In order to get those tools, they usually require a lot of regulatory changes with their respective provincial governments. One of the challenges that TransLink will have is the fuel tax. So right now you're getting hundreds of thousands of hours of, of transit service a year off of the 18 and a half cents of fuel tax. But the problem is that we're getting vehicles that are becoming more efficient. We're getting vehicles that are electric. And your ability to raise revenue was very constrained, especially at the front end of the pandemic, but also it's going to sunset over time and something will have to transition to fill that gap if you want to maintain the services that you have today. Now, I do want to make it clear, having more electric or fuel efficient vehicles on the road is an objectively good thing for the environment. It should be celebrated. Unfortunately for us, that social shift is directly impacting the way we operate. We're certainly not going to figure out how we're going to address that issue in this podcast episode alone, but it's something that our experts are constantly researching and planning for. All right, now let's get back to Sabrina. If this was a private sector enterprise, maybe things would be easier. Maybe it'd be like faster and maybe more money would be involved, but that's not the way we operate. We do answer to the public. It's our role as the Transportation Authority of Metro Vancouver in this region of BC. Uh, how does that play into all of this? Because really, we need to get feedback from people that are not just going to benefit from the services, which would be great. It's all positive remarks. But there are sometimes concerns from people who might not view it that way. You're absolutely correct. Uh, there are other models of transportation deliveries, but in particular the Asian model. It tends to be a private company in a lot of the large Asian metropolises that run, that are developers actually. So they're developing um, housing or, or retail or, or whatever those, th those things are around transit hubs. And then the transit service is provided as like 
an add-on to that. We don't operate in that manner. We are primarily a public transit operator that's run with public funds. We absolutely have a duty to consult with um, individuals at every stage of that development because, as you mentioned, uh, there are people that will support a project. There are people that will maybe support the objectives of the project, but depends on the details, depends on the alignment and, and other details. Uh, and working through that in a, in a organized fashion to make sure that the project at the end of the day is, is the best fit for that particular context. That's one of the reasons why the consultation is really important and another part that adds to the length of time in terms of getting a project from conception all the way to being built and, and, and ready. The bus route or SkyTrain car a customer is riding on right now, how does TransLink pay for that? I'm going to break that down just a little bit. Um, TransLink, much like your local government, has two types of money. It's capital and operating. And in your question, the bus route would be operating and, and that SkyTrain car would be capital. But capital money is what we use to build a new widget. We use it to buy that bus or maybe dig a big hole to put a SkyTrain line, build a depot to store and maintain our vehicles, that type of, that type of expense. Now, operating is a little bit different. It's that yearly expenditure that we need to put out to run or maintain what it is that we bought or we built. So the lion's share for us of this is operator salaries for the buses, obviously, uh, but also SkyTrain attendants. That number also in operating also includes things like rent and other, other overhead. Capital money is significantly easier for us to come by. First of all, we can borrow for it. Um, but we also get a lot of partnerships with the province and the federal government. They partner with us to the order of 40% from this particular, this current federal government um, for capital costs, 40% from the province, and then 20% from us uh, to provide most of those dollars that we need to buy or build something. There's a number of reason why, reasons why capital is a little bit easier for us. It's a one-time cost. It can be borrowed at discounted government rates. Operating funds are a little bit less glamorous, and they're much harder to come by. Um, those are usually entirely the responsibility of local or regional governments. And so if we bought a new SkyTrain line and we are only paying 20%, the region's only paying 20% of the capital costs, we are paying 100% of the operating costs for the duration of that asset for the whole life cycle. So it's kind of a big deal. Um, and so those tools, we only just have a handful of them. This, uh, those talking about earlier, fares are about one third, fuel sales tax is another third, and property tax are another third. So if we need more of that operating money, those are the only, the major three area levers that we can pull. And there is really big um, limitations to all of them. Uh, you mentioned earlier, fuel sales tax, for example, people are shifting to uh, EV vehicles. So if we moved that number even higher, then more people would shift to EV vehicles, and we, would, we wouldn't we would be any further ahead in terms of total revenue dollars. Skytrain extensions, new rapid bus lines, gondolas, and faster performance. Increased service or improved technology really depends on one thing, funding. But it's important to know that all of these projects are designed to improve your way of life, to get you from point A to point B faster and more reliably than ever before, allowing us to continue building connections across communities and to deliver tomorrow what we're planning today. My thanks to Sabrina Lautexier for her time and expertise, David Cooper for another Scoop with Coop, producer Alan Tung for his tireless work on this podcast, and to you for listening and subscribing. Now, don't forget to leave us a review. We love your five-star ratings and want to know what else we should talk about on this podcast. Email us at any time with your ideas, podcast at translink.ca. I've been your host, John Jang, and until next time, have a safe trip.